welcome to this session of Going Deeper. And we begin as usual by asking God's blessing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear God, as we reflect on these scripture passages that have to do with Jesus' last hours of his life, we pray that we may be really attentive to what Jesus is saying and that we would bring to focus all of our blessings in terms of our intuition, our hearts, our souls, our minds, that we may discover and live out the richness of what is contained in the scripture passages for these Sundays between now and the end of the church year on the fourth Sunday of November. And so we pray that just as Jesus spoke your word, Creator God, and we pray that as we reflect on that sacred word, we may be blessed as were the people who accepted it when he walked this earth and May we be transformed by it so that we can live ever more faithfully through Christ our Lord. Amen. Wanna <clears throat> pay no attention for just a half a second. I'm sorry. <laughs> Better. Okay. Obviously we have a slightly different environment this morning from other sessions of going deeper. Um, we're continuing to have work done in the church on lighting and in order to get the person here to do repair work <clears throat> have to abide by his schedule so here we are in the parish office and we're dealing with passages in the 21st chapter of Matthew and at the beginning of chapter 21 we see how Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem is the last week of his life and in entering the city many people were there to greet him and to sing praise and to honor him which of course immediately riled up the leaders of the people some scripture scholars say that as Jesus entered one part of the city on a donkey pilots uh, military people entered another part of the city on their gigantic horses. And so the difference between a horse and a donkey um, indicates a difference between Jesus, the humble servant, and the nonviolent one versus a horse that could obviously do great damage or, or the riders on them would do great damage. So one of the first things Jesus did upon entering Jerusalem was he went to the temple and he didn't have a very um, pleasant message for the people there because they were not using the temple as a place to celebrate God's presence. Uh, they did a number of things and were carrying over the ancient tradition that the prophets had asked that it be discontinued, namely the sacrificing of animals, thinking that that somehow or another would remove or uh, re, uh, take care of the sins that people had committed. And the prophets continued to say, no, it is a contrite heart, a heart that is open to God's goodness that God wanted all along. And so, Jesus went to the temple to reaffirm what many of the prophets had said in the several hundred years before then. And of course, again, the authorities were not very thrilled with Jesus calling them to look at things from a very different perspective. And of course, uh, along the way, chief priests and elders asked Jesus, by what authority are you doing these things? And by whose authority? And just to review, it's a question that could easily have 
who shamed Jesus, where he would have been dishonored. But we, one of the things we want to learn from Jesus, particularly in our world with its contentiousness and divisiveness and name calling and all the rest of it, how is it that we, like Jesus, can retain our dignity and our honor? And so Jesus said, I'll answer your question if you answer the question I have. And the question was, was John's baptism of heaven or of human origin? And they knew that whichever way they answered, they were in trouble. And so they said, we don't know. And Jesus then said, then neither will I answer your question. And then last Sunday's gospel follows immediately after that, when he talks about, has the parable of the two sons, one saying, no, I won't go, and then later changes his mind, and the second who says yes, and then never goes. Again, it can be a somewhat difficult uh, passage because in some cultures, they would see that the second son was the honorable one in terms of saying yes, because that was the way to honor his father. Regardless mm -hmm. of what actions he took or didn't take afterwards, he honored his father by saying yes, realizing, of course, that this transaction probably took place in a public setting. And some scripture scholars say that uh, they were in the midst of all the other vineyard workers. And so for the first son to say, no, I'm not gonna go, uh, the vineyard workers would think, holy smokes, um, who are we working for here? Who are we working mm -hmm. for here? Um, his own son is a rotten brat, telling him no. And they would think that the second son was honorable. So we, of course, most, well, I sh shouldn't say we. <laughs> Some cultures, the one I belong to, would definitely go with the first son doing what the father wanted, that we get around to doing what the father wanted. And uh, <clears throat> there is no honor in saying yes and doing nothing. But there are cultures that look at this very differently and in the Middle East it would have been uh, the first way that I said where saying yes was the appropriate honorable way to respond to the father um, and so what the point of all that is that we want to find out how different cultures and ethnic groups look at various situations in our world today because it is not appropriate for one culture to say well that's a stupid thing i mean you know we're into producing things so we're concerned about getting out there and getting things done pick those grapes they're not gonna and and others will say no 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 um honor is a very important thing and um and we know that there are some cultures where uh, you ask uh, a question and they will say yes almost all the time because to say no is disrespectful. And so we need to determine then and to develop the ear when does yes mean yes and when does yes mean no. And um, again, we can tell the people of, the, of, that, of that kind of culture, well, come on, don't be ridiculous. Um, we need to have clear answers here. Well, who are we to tell one culture? We have one culture to tell another how they're supposed to, we need to respect each other and come to understand each other and go on from there. So we're in then the next passage that follows immediately after this uh, one with the two sons. And of course, Jesus lets the chief priests and elders know that they made a big mistake in not listening to John the Baptist and implied in that little parable is that they're making an even more serious mistake in not listening 
to Jesus because he, as we were go are going to see in today's gospel, that Jesus is, in a way, God's last and final way to say, I don't know what else I can do except send my very own son to say, show you what human beings are capable of. How Jesus, through his human nature, revealed my nature, God's nature, the creator's nature of love. And that we hopefully and uh, will accept that message unlike the chief priests and elders in last Sunday's gospel. And this coming Sunday's gospel again is focused on the chief priests and elders. So <clears throat> we pray that unlike the chief priests and elders, we would say yes to Jesus, regardless of whom we might have said no to in the past, or, or we may have said yes and then gotten far afield, way off the track, but that we can again realize that the love of God embedded within us constantly calls us to reflect on the word of God made real in Jesus, made human in Jesus, and the words that are contained in our scriptures, words of God. So we continue today then, as I mentioned, Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 43. And if we have a Bible, Matthew 21, 33 to 43. And if we depend on the internet, it's USCCB daily readings October 4th, and uh, those, this gospel passage should appear. So off we go. Everybody ready? Ready. Ready. Jesus said to the chief priests and the elders of the people, hear another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a hedge around it, and dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. Then he leased it to tenants and went on a journey. When vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to obtain his produce. We'll stop there for just a minute. So in this section of the gospel, the landowner is a stand-in for God, the creator. And God has provided us out of God's generosity and ingenuity and creativity, the vineyard. And in this case, the vineyard symbolizes God's people, which includes us. But we're going to be celebrating the Feast of St. Francis on Sunday. And so the vineyard can also be a symbol for all of creation. And in line with what Pope Francis continues to ask us to pay attention to, is that God has entrusted all of creation to our care. And, <clears throat> and to whom has he entrusted it? In this case, he's uh, entrusted it to tenants and is, again, he's talking to chief priests and elders. And so they would be seen as the tenants of the vineyard, the caretakers of the vineyard, but they are only stand-ins for all of us. And when a vintage time comes, he sends his servants, and those servants um, are stand-ins for the various prophets that God sent to the people from many hundreds of years earlier until very not very long before the birth of Jesus. And the role of the prophets was basically to, again, put into human terms what God wanted of God, the people that God created. And we talk about God's chosen people, but those who considered themselves chosen was not necessarily a privilege unless we see the privilege being that they were to be a light and a source of hope 
a source of goodness and justice for all people in the world. Uh, they were to share with others what they experience about God being a personal God and one God, not multiple gods. And we, of course, in uh, the church developed one God in three persons, the Trinity, but it's still one God. And that's based all the way back to Abraham in about 1800 years before the birth of Jesus, where again, paying attention to his intuition, paying attention to his inner being, he came to the conclusion that, wait a minute, all these gods that I, and I'm living in the midst of these people who worship all kinds of things, and I, that doesn't make any sense. And so he came in the midst of all of that chaotic stuff to believe in one God. And as we've mentioned before, Abraham is seen as the father of faith for three of the main uh, segments of faith. It's not a good way to say it, but the Jewish people, Muslim people, and Christian people. Abraham is seen as the father of those three um, faith orientations. So when uh, Jesus and the landowner sends his servants, the reference is, and we're going to look at this from, hopefully we'll have time to look at this from a very different perspective as well. But this is the one that most scripture scholars lean to um, because it is helps um, is the most easy one to apply to today and that is that God sent these prophets his servants to help people get on the right track to relate with God in a personal loving intimate way and then to treat each other in caring loving uh, respectful, honorable ways. And what happened when the first set of servants came to obtain the landowner's produce? The tenants, chief priests and elders, as again symbols for all the people, seized the servants. And one they beat, another they killed, and a third they stoned. And each of those is a reference to how a distinct prophet in the Old Testament was treated. So it's based somewhat on history in that regard. So that first attempt was didn't uh, work out the way God had intended. And did God say, I don't know what I'm going to do with these people? Uh, this is just, uh, it's just so ridiculous. This is not what I had in mind when I created them. Um, but what does God do? Again, he sent other servants, other prophets, more numerous than the first ones. But they, meaning the chief priests and elders, and again, they are a symbol for all the people, treated them in the same way that the people just refused to listen. And that the leaders of the people didn't help the people to listen because they were in power. And for them to have listened to the prophets would have meant that they would have lost power. And they didn't realize that real power is in loving and accepting one another and seeing the best in each other and drawing together as a community based on the goodness of God that exists within every human being and that exists in all of creation. And so <clears throat> they, as the gospel states, they treated these servants in the same way. And then finally, he sent his son to them, thinking, they will respect my son. God will go through any lengths to try to get us to focus 
on what is most important in life. And <clears throat> of course, the son, it represents a stand-in for Jesus himself. When the tenants saw the son, they said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and acquire his inheritance. Now we might think, that's pretty ridiculous. How stupid can these people be? But we need to understand that, and this is where it gets a little bit uh, edgy in terms of the landowner symbolizing God, because he's seen as an absentee landlord. And so when the sun comes, these people thought, whoo, as the landowner died, and the son is here to claim his inheritance, this vineyard. Well, if we kill him, we're, we perhaps can claim ownership of the vineyard as the first ones to be aware that the vineyard didn't have an owner in the way that they looked at things in that day. So their efforts weren't entirely ridiculous. I mean, they were ridiculous, yes, in it killing the son, again, what's that going to accomplish? So, <clears throat> um, they killed him, they seized him, I should say, as that gospel says, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now, we're not, scripture scholars aren't clear whether Jesus, in this case, was talking to him about himself, or whether when the Gospels got written, um, they would have said, well, I mean, this, this fit perfectly with what, how Jesus was treated. He was seized in the garden, uh, thrown out of the vineyard. He died outside of the city of Jerusalem and died a wretched death. Um, so, <clears throat> Whether, again, whether Jesus was talking about himself, which I think is quite reasonable, and part that quite that he was indeed referring to himself, because, I mean, again, he was a very conscious person, and he knew very well, and particularly since he upped the ante, since he entered Jerusalem, allowing people to honor him in the ways that they did, and went to the temple, and really challenge the people. I mean, again, it's a whole control and power issue. And we know that people in power don't usually care to give it up easily, if at all. And I can say that about myself, too. I don't know how many times in my life I've been called a control freak. Um, I think I've pretty well taken care of that since. <laughs> not. Anyway, and then of course, as we reflected last Sunday, when, uh, well, wait, before last Sunday, when they came to him and said, by what authority are you doing this? Again, they shamed themselves and they didn't like being shamed any more than any of us likes being shamed. And then he tells the story of the parable of last Sunday and he's saying, you know, folks, um, tax collectors and prostitutes have accepted John the Baptist's message. And even, why did, why did you not learn from them? Can you imagine the shame they felt? My gosh, he's comparing us to tax collectors and prostitutes. And it's not that Jesus is doing bad nasties to these people. He's just simply pointing out what they have done to themselves by not listening to John the Baptist or by listening to him. That there is no other outcome in not listening to Jesus, but that we would shame ourselves, that we would be, we would dishonor ourselves and dishonor one another. Because in accepting Jesus, we're saying, yes, I will accept love as Jesus did, and I will share it as generously as did Jesus, or that I will be as loving as Jesus was.
to the best of my ability. Then the question. Again, the point of the parable. What will the owner of the vineyard do to those tenants when he comes? That's where the parable would have stopped. And we need to remember that, again, this is a very public situation. And it may have taken an hour for Jesus to tell this, what otherwise seemed like a fairly brief parable, because everybody would have been commenting and, or saying, Master, please, who, who are you referring to? And, of course, Jesus, in his own ingenious way, as an excellent teacher, would have engaged these people and, and helped them to get clear about what he was talking about. And they, of course, would have argued as well, and said, no, no, that way, well, anyway. Um, it would be interesting if we uh, developed that kind of style in um, during Mass. And, um, but we're not there yet. Or maybe we are. <laughs> maybe we should try it. So again, as I say, the parable stopped when, what will the owner of the vineyard do to those tenants when he comes? And they answered, he will put those wretched men to a wretched death and lease his vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the proper times. So let's take those words. He will put those wretched men to a wretched death. Who is putting them to death? It is they who have determined their own fate. And that's the same for us. If we're not going to choose to follow Jesus, we're basically condemning ourselves. God does not need to do one ounce of condemning. We know by what standards we will be judged, and that is the standards that Jesus established in his humanity. And God is not going to, what, dishonor us by saying, I judge you to blah, 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 blah. God will, I think, we don't know how it's gonna be, but I think God will say, well, would you share with me how much you imitated Jesus, how close you got to loving the way Jesus did. And that means that we come, hopefully, to loving everyone, because everyone is a person of God. And that means that we have to come to we have to be able to listen to one another and we have to accept one another as God's beloved. So there's this universal population that we can't just say, well, I treated these people very well, but you know, those others, um, I, I just didn't see eye to eye with them. Well, we don't necessarily have to see eye to eye what we're called upon to, is to accept one another as God's people. Now, there are people in the world, obviously, who are very, very difficult to accept. But does that mean we are not called to love them as God's people? Don't have to like them necessarily, but we're called to love them. So after the leaders said, uh, uh, well, the, the wretched people will be put to a wretched death, Jesus said, did you not ever read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? By the Lord has this been done, and it is wonderful in our eyes. And so, what Jesus is referring to is 
He is the cornerstone of our lives. He is the one on whom we base our lives, um, the foundation on which we establish how we will live our lives and how we will find meaning and purpose and fulfillment in following to the fullest possible degree the example of Jesus. And the last line of the gospel, therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that will produce its fruit. Um, it's a somewhat esoteric statement. It's along the lines of the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Um, we're not entirely sure what Jesus meant by that. Um, so that's one way of looking at this particular passage that we have been entrusted with God's vineyard and in our case we see the vineyard as a symbol for all God's people, in fact all of creation. And we have present day prophets who have helped us to figure out ways to get along. And present day prophets include the saints and St. Francis for one, um, who lived a number of centuries ago, is certainly a prophet on how he looked at nature and referred to aspects of nature as his sisters and brothers, um, as a way for him to acknowledge how connected he saw himself with all that God created. And <clears throat> there are others in the history of the Christian era. And I want to just focus very briefly on a, a couple of people who would be considered modern day saints. And one of them is Gandhi, uh, because he somehow came to the conclusion that nonviolence was the only way to go. Now, he was not a Christian, but he certainly has a lot to teach us about that, about the issue of nonviolence, because it's completely in line with the way that Jesus lived. Of course, then we have our own, within our own country, people like Martin Luther King. And I know that when people hear his name, they may think of, oh, well, yes, but he, uh, he also had his sinful side. Well, don't we all? And we can make our choice as to what we want to imitate and what, what goodness and wisdom we want to draw from his life. And so he, people could be bashed with, and treated horribly with, by dogs and guns and rocks and whatever else were thrown at these people black people, African-American people, and he would say constantly, do not respond in kind, remain nonviolent. And he would encourage the people to pray, to again focus on the sacredness of God present within us and present within one another, that our being nonviolent is the greatest challenge we can express to that which is unjust. Unjust meaning that we are not treating each other as God's beloved. We are not treating each other the way God wants us to treat one another. That is justice in the Bible, and it is justice that we are called to establish in our world today that we develop ways to find, to work together, to affirm each other, and to draw out from one another the goodness in which we have been created so that we can establish communities that truly do our best to 
live the way Jesus did. I, you, you're not able to get any questions, are you? Mm -hmm. Have any come in? No. What? Except for um, Mona said she was ready. <laughs> oh, okay. Good. Thanks, Mona. <clears throat> So let me take a second or two and um, allow my mind to catch up with words or, or whatever. You do that too. <laughs> case, uh, case may be. So the tenants, the chief priests and elders, again, resisted Jesus and um, did not accept his message. And they resisted God who entrusted to them the leadership of the people. And, <clears throat> um, and so God sent his son. Now, we know that the symbol of a vineyard can be a very rich one. We know that in order to grow grapes, the vineyard has to have very, very special care. And um, it's got to have the right moisture, the right fertilizer, um, the right nutrients, the right amount of sunshine and all the rest. Um, and of course, the vines have to be taken care of. When I first came, the first time I came to California in 1969, um, it was in the middle of summer, and um, driving past the vineyards up and down the San Joaquin Valley, I saw these vines just growing all over the place, loaded with grapes. And then when winter set in, they started pruning, and all that was left was a stump. And I thought, that's a strange way to grow more grapes, to kill the darn thing. But lo and behold, following summer, same as the previous summer, vines all over the place, loaded with luscious grapes. Um, so that's the kind of um, image that we want to keep in mind for how we treat each other. That we are in many ways no different from a grapevine in that we need tender care. We need to be treated with all the goodness that we need in order to grow and to be able to produce in kind God's goodness, to reproduce it, whatever the case is. And the love of God, the care of God, also is quite capable of pruning us. Just as great grape vines are pruned because uh, the, all the, the stuff that is no longer useful, uh, particularly our sins, um, are only going to drain us of energy is why the dead vines are cut off because they're only going to uh, suck energy that is needed for the new vines to grow. And so the image of a vineyard is really a very precious one. And of course, Jesus knew about vineyards because they were part of the uh, culture in which he lived. So again, we pray that we would do our best to allow all of God's gifts to um, help us to grow, to um, allow God to remove from us anything that can drain us of energy. That when we have been shamed, for instance, that we allow the love of God to say, you know, um, you may have been shamed, you may feel horrible, you may feel like responding in kind, but again, God's love um, prunes us of any idea to respond in kind, to respond by shaming somebody else. 
and his love um, also, of course, renews for us the honor in which we have been created. And of course, now at this point in history, especially with our elections coming up, how wonderful it would be the more we focused on what leaders up and down the ballot are going to make it most possible, most likely for us to honor each other and not shame each other, to help each other connect with each other by the goodness in which each of us has been created, to connect with each other so that we can, uh, as grapevines continue to grow all over the place, we can make connections all over the place and together produce this energy that is going to transform others or uh, make it possible for others to say, I think I choose to live the way those people are living because they're treating each other honorably. Um, they don't have any power struggles and all that kind of thing. They do their best to honor each other and support each other and encourage each other. And, um, and when things go off the rails, they allow the love of God to say, well, yeah, okay, that road, God saying, I, I'll take care of that. Hand it to me. I want you to focus on, again, my grace, my love, my goodness, and to continue on the way of developing whatever words we use, energy, vibration, cosmic forces, uh, whatever it may be, that we come together and allow ourselves to do that to the best possible degree. So for a few minutes, I want to talk about another way to look at this parable. And that one is that the landowner is indeed, does not represent God at all that we take the land, uh, absentee landlord as an absentee landlord. And as an absentee landlord, obviously he was wealthy and probably owned a number of vineyards. And how did he come to own those vineyards? In a variety of ways, um, and many of them not very honorable. <clears throat> so, the tenants in this case were the common people. Many of them who may have had small vineyards themselves, but with these wealthy people uh, or the Roman Empire taxing them to death, lost the vineyard. And these people with wealth could buy them up. And so these small farmers, if we want to say that, small vintners um, may be working now in somebody else's vineyard which uh, if you gather a number of these people together we'd say yeah that used to be mine that used to be your man, and on and here they are working together for this absentee landlord who um, might be paying them and we reflected on that several weeks ago with the vineyard owner who paid uh, people that came for just an hour, he paid them the same as those who worked all day. And we can interpret that in a couple of different ways, that regardless of what that man paid, it was stingy. It was a, a small amount, hardly that which honored anybody. And again, um, that that's how the wealthy in those days, I'm not gonna comment on today, uh, the wealthy in those days became even more wealthy because they just simply skimped and whatever and um, in the process uh, human beings, the workers became more and more dehumanized, more and more dishonored, more and more shamed. And so the other way of looking at this parable is that the, um, the, te the tenants actually did kill the messengers that the landowner said. And so as Jesus 
if that's the way Jesus was telling this parable, all the poor people standing around would have said, yes, there is hope. Um, how is it that we're finally going to get these wealthy people to treat us with dignity? How is it that we can get back what is ours, what was ours, but was taken for us, from us, because of such unjust systems of taxation and loans and all the other kinds of things that were part of the way commerce was done in those days. And so it would have been a way of affirming those people, um, call them tenants, and maybe in this case, Jesus would have said slaves. Um, how is it that through telling this parable in that light, Jesus was really affirming these people and saying, yes, landowners, Roman Empire, you're not treating people well. And if you don't wake up soon enough, they're going to find ways to get to you and they're going to find ways to regain their dignity, their honor. And so watch out because you're not going to end up in a very good situation. So it was a warning to all the people in authority, including the religious authority. You're participating in this same oppression. You ourselves are demanding that these people observe to the best of their degree over 600 laws. How oppressive can you get? Um, and you're uh, also exacting from them a temple tax. And of course, we go back to when Jesus entered the city. Um, we first went, the city of Jerusalem, first went to the temple and uh, he talked about how you're making this place a den of thieves. And it wasn't necessarily talking about what was going on at that very moment. He was talking about the history of how these religious leaders, to one degree or another, were exacting, uh, demanding this temple tax that was supposed to go primarily to the poor. And instead, in many cases, was providing a luxurious life to the leaders. So again, things were just off the track. And Jesus saying, you know, you need to, you need to come to respect these people and you need to help them to live as God's beloved and you are failing. And so here is another opportunity for you to hear the message of how God wants people to be treated. And so please choose to do it. Well, we know what happened. That if Jesus hadn't established enough opposition throughout the three years of his mission work in Galilee and other places, in what we now call the Holy Land. This last, these last few days um, from what we consider Sunday to Thursday, um, Jesus definitely, in his last effort to get these people to realize how they were bombing out badly, and then he would call them to change, um, that they again, resisted him um, and in so many different ways by whose authority do you do this i mean they saw jesus as just a human being they well you're from nazareth what that good can come out of all those various uh, things that they threw at jesus they did not realize that jesus was there as a human being to show them what each person is capable of when we accept God's love and when we treat the other in that love. And so that no one was to be excluded from that. And so Jesus eating with tax collectors and prostitutes was a clear sign to how 
they were God's people too. And that in eating with them, Jesus was saying, I accept you as a sign of how God continues to accept you as his beloved, despite whatever wrong roads you have taken in life. Come on back to the high road um, and live life in my love. So in that sense, this parable is quite an indictment against the, all the leaders, Roman Empire, religious leaders, Jesus saying, you cannot treat people in such dishonorable ways. It's not going to work. In the end, you who have the power will find yourselves powerless. And not in a way that you can accomplish any good, because you will simply be as these people answered the very question, the wretched will be put to a wretched death. Um, and it has nothing to do with God and um, how just distracted by a noise. I think it's important for us to focus on, especially as we um, near the finish line for today, focus on how Jesus called people to accept the love of God, to treat each other as equals in the eyes of God, and find ways to work together to accomplish to the best of our abilities what we pray about in the Our Father, that the kingdom will be, we will see to what degree we, we can create what we imagine to be going on in heaven, to what degree we can create that here on earth. Namely, that we truly choose to be people who honor each other and that we treat each other in loving ways, not violent ways, and uh, that we find ways to use the resources of the earth for the benefit of all people. Um, so I think we're, I'm leaving a few things kind of uh, floating in the air, but that's all right. I'll, I'll depend on you to ask questions and say, well, you know, this piece of went kind of flittering off and that one went, so would you mind uh, figuring out a way to bring them together? Um, I ask you to help me with that because uh, this is not really just meant to be me um, talking at you, even though that's the medium we choose. Um, I also very much want you to give me feedback, ask me questions, so that um, th we can uh, take in these messages to the best of our ability because um, they're very powerful messages, in some ways overwhelming, uh, because we, we realize that when we look at how Jesus and God, the Creator, want things to be, and we look at reality, that's part of what's causing us so much discomfort these days, because we, we know we're, we're just, there's quite a separation between the two, and it's frustrating. And we only can get together and bring it closer so that we can say, yes, we really are doing our best to create the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And so we end by uh, again, referring to our second reading, where <clears throat> we pray, it states that we have no anxiety at all. <laughs> well, wouldn't that be delightful? Um, but again, that's the goal, that we can be as rooted in the goodness of God 
as possible and that we can continue to live with gratitude for all that god has entrusted to our care and that we can make our requests known to god that the peace of god will continue to guard our hearts and minds through jesus christ our lord amen in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen, amen. I do have a question. It's a quick one. Um, I was wondering if you could give us, or if perhaps those who are online can type in, some sources to help us to discern our moral consciences, uh, to discern the scriptures. You know, you mentioned two very different um, ways to interpret that gospel. And you mentioned that perhaps... Jesus did not say this last part. What are some sources that we can turn to to look at that that perhaps some that you trust or that again we can write some that we trust to help us? Okay. You're a good one, but and Father Marcel, but other than that. Yeah, let me ponder that because okay. um uh, I yeah I don't I, I mean I know I could refer to several books um, actually uh, in terms of what we're reflecting on these last several weeks a very excellent book would be this one parables for preachers now obviously it was written for preachers but um, Parable for Preachers by Barbara Reed, R-E-I-D. Um, she's a Dominican sister, um, I think has just recently retired from teaching scripture courses at the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, is a very brilliant writer and has written a, a considerable number of books and articles. So I, and generally, I think she's somebody that I mean, I can read it and understand it. So, um, and that's why I free, feel free to recommend it, uh, rec recommend this book. And of course, you can then Google her name and uh, I'm pretty sure that you will find re references to a variety of things that she has written. And so she is an excellent one to um, uh, refer to. Okay, thank you. And so let me think about others that I might um, suggest as well. Okay, thank you. Another book, possibly, is um, can't think of it. How to I think how to speak Christian. Oh. <laughs> And it takes many scripture passages, but I'll I'll be I'll, I'll I'll make a note of that and bring the actual title and author because I forgot that too. Um, okay. uh, I think it's John Crossman, but I don't know. But uh, anyway, I'll bring the reference next week. Okay. So. Thank you. I put you on the spot, but thank you. And and again, yeah, if anybody um, here now or who's viewing at a later date. Would like to leave any trusted references perhaps. well and if any of you have read things that you think would be helpful for others uh that's also quite um in line and would be appreciated okay. thank you bye bye have a wonderful day everybody yeah. bye